so let's see how it goes with the time. But uh, summary is maybe the right word, because I mean, in, in a bit more than 10 minutes, of course, it is going to be quite rather summarizing work here. But anyway, the context of uh, what we're working with here is that, of course, uh, production in around uh, Europe is done you know, for, for dairy or beef or dual purpose cattle is in quite different uh, 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 environmental conditions and geographical con conditions. That's on the one side. Also, there's a quite different uh, production systems that uh, we are using to produce uh, with these animals. So the Agentor ambition was to provide tools and knowledge that promote to increase efficiency and resilience uh, at the individual animal level as well as on the system population level, and in particular also with a view of how it works at local environments. So, and in that context, and, and we want to use both the within breed, but also a cross breed variation in doing this. So it's not just a project for a particular uh, high level breed, it's really to see uh, across the scale. So in, Trying to, to achieve this, we decided to work with some themes. And um, one theme we just saw well presented by EMRA, which was a uh, genomic tool for systematic crossbreeding systems uh, and, and more at mixed breeding systems. Um, genomic prediction across different environments. Uh, genomic models for efficiency directly for the traits of efficiency and resilience and uh, also some uh, management tools to let farmers decide, you know, give them tools to decide the fate of the cows and the animals in the systems, what, how to make, uh, in general, to give them a more efficient and resilient uh, uh, system. So, I mean, uh, why do we think that crossbreeding comes into this? So, the thing with crossbreeding is, of course, that uh, a farmer can choose, or you can combine strengths of different breeds um, uh, to, to uh, make the animal fit well the environmental conditions of the farm. So um, you can exploit this, so you may have a farmer where you need a high productivity, but you may want to quickly you know, add some more higher fertility, higher longevity to this breed. So we think that crossbreeding in a way can be used at a local scale in a way to accelerate the, the direction to this uh, efficiency. And if you use um, uh, a sex semen, you can also add in, you know, that you want to use uh, to select for, I mean, to decide the fate of the, the, of the cow. Do you want to ha have a replacement heifer? Um, or do you want to produce some meat on the final, on the final and get a beef uh, production on that? So then you may want to use uh, beef on the dairy in that situation. So the thing is that um, um, prior to Gentor and in terms of really using these um, uh, across, you know, multi-breed, across-breed, uh, genomic evaluation, you need, in order to make these decisions to the farm, you need uh, these tools to say something about the genomics of the animal and they were not really available. And uh, Emra just gave a very nice uh, presentation about that, so I can go a bit quickly. Uh, I think he underplayed maybe a little bit his own contribution, which was the, main, the first main paper that came up with the, uh, the full model. Um, and uh, as, he's, as Emra said, we have working with different kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, ways to make them applicable for larger scale industry level uh, applications and we have worked with different uh, systems. Um, uh, Anna is um, presenting, uh, and and Emma was much more exact. He knew that he knew the time and maybe the room even where Anna is going to give this presentation. I just know here that it's in session 25, but uh, where she's going to show that in a in a real scenario, this model does give a uh, very big improvement on the genomic prediction of the crossbreeds. She's also going to show a little bit about why is it problematic in, in, in some scenarios. And um, 
So he's going to give a little bit of uh, insight as to um, um, the reason in the, in the Nordic Red, I think, why it was problematic and using probabilities of uh, breed of origin of alleles rather than the absolute uh, values. Um, there's, we have worked with the uh, rotational crossbreeding systems of Montpellier, Holstein, and, and uh, Danish Red, or, uh, and um, uh, the friends are going to show results from this in, in session two of the World Congress. So you don't have to wait very long. It is the second talk, I think, of the, of the Congress. Um, and uh, as mentioned by Emra, a way to make this more applicable in larger systems was to, to, to be able to use the summary statistics for in the especially interesting if you have relatively few crossbreds and a huge populations of purebred animals that you want to bring in when you and you want to use still you know crossbred and purebred information simultaneously and i think that uh, we can say software i mean uh, emra also we have in context of gento also just um, performed a uh, training uh, workshop and uh, what I hear so far is that it was very successful, and I think uh, Emra, some uh, softwares will also be available and, and sort of um, pipelines of how to analyze this whole thing. Um, so uh, the other theme was uh, D by E uh, and, and uh, models for, uh, for analyzing genetic data across different environments. Uh, and of course, there are two sort of uh, state of the art. There are two sort of uh, models that are usually used for that. Uh, either we have uh, multi-trade models in where we have very categorical um, um, uh, different uh, environments, or um, uh, uh, sort of random regression model where you use sort of the trajectory of different uh, environmental uh, conditions. And in Gentor, there was in a work package a lot of work in uh, classifying uh, different uh, farm level, different kinds of uh, environmental factors, different kinds of um, uh, geographical and uh, uh, factors and so forth. And um, in the Bahrain Fleckley, we tried to use these factors in D by E models. Uh, to predict uh, um, genetics of uh, different environments. And uh, relatively limited D by E was um, observed. In another scenario, um, the French used a, um, uh, the productivity or, or the, the, the herd levels as the environmental factor and uh, observed some um, D by E um, for especially for, for I think clinical mastitis mainly. Um, so for some of these uh, disease traits, there may be strong G by E with the with the most extreme environments. So uh, this will also be presented in the World Congress in session uh, 27. So please go there and, and get some more information on the details. And. Um, uh, not least, uh, Interpol also made some work in, in uh, multi-country evaluation of uh, AIDS slaughter, and uh, it's all been implemented in the Interpol system. So the other thing was that we wanted to work with what, what if you have important QTL that are, uh, have a different effect in different kind of environments, uh, in different kind of extreme environments. So. The Dutch were interested in, in um, being able to model a sort of a chains of covariances of the QTL over different environments. And uh, we also wanted it to be able to use sort of standard software. So they came up with a protocol um, where you sort of um, split the analysis in, in two, and first you train the model in, in, in particular environments, and then you can use uh, variances from these, um, or SNP effects from these uh, models to um, uh, weight the SNPs in the, the final model in stage two. Um, 
So in, in the theoretic work, so with, with the simulated data, there was a slight uh, improvement in, in genomic prediction for particular environments when you do the, uh, use this approach. And uh, it's also used in, uh, in uh, a multi-breed analysis of the Irish breed, uh, uh, dairy and beef crosses. And uh, there was some evidence of GBAE. The genomic model worked well, but uh, we didn't see an increase in actually using these uh, heterogeneous SNP uh, variances over the genome. And uh, the state-of-the-art analysis of the flex fee data is also ongoing with this model now, so, so we'll see in the end if uh, that brings improvements. So now, of course, um, well, we also worked specifically with the efficiency traits and some of, in the growth efficiency you saw in the, some of the previous examples, uh, feed efficiency in dairy is of course a, a very uh, hot topic because it's, uh, feed is the, sort of the biggest cost of uh, producing milk um, and it's important for economic and environmental sustainability. Uh, we worked on the back of uh, work in the, in, the, in, the, in the efficiency work package where Martin et al. made this um, um, uh, dynamic IFI model uh, where you sort of use more the dynamic nature of, of, of the lactation. And this is also, oh, well, this is a produced in animal, yeah. So the work here is mainly to add the genomic component to that. And um, as we know, feed intake is the limiting factor. So, uh, so we're using multi-country data, mainly uh, research farm data for, on the feed intake. Um, and this work is also going to present it at the World Congress. Rasmus is going to present this model on, you know, novel genetic parameters to improve genomic uh, IFI in dairy cattle using big data from multiple lactations and countries. In terms of resilience, I mean, the cows are met with um, um, uh, your challenges over uh, the whole time. And uh, um, the a resilient cow can cope with these challenges and resume quickly to the production level. So we have basically two ways for looking at this in terms of genetics in the project. So first one is, is more like the local time, uh, so and the, on the short term. So, um, um, and, and uh, Marike Poppy is going to present this paper in session 27, where she's looking at different uh, traits defined as to how the uh, uh, milk production deviates from uh, an expected curve over time and define traits to use as resilience traits for selection. The other way is to look at it more like an accumulated effect over the lifetime of the cow. And uh, it's also uh, based on work from the same work packets. It's going well with the time here, right? And um, um, so more, so what about the accumulated effects over the, over the, over the lifetime? And uh, in the end, um, uh, it was decided that you know functional longevity is really accu accumulating all of these effects over over the time, but it, the information comes very late, and there are many uh, component traits that com that uh, contribute to this uh, longevity, and the most important ones are disease traits um, and um, and confirmation traits as well. So. Uh, the friends came up with this two-step approach, one where we analyze the component traits with their most appropriate uh, model because the phenotypes are expressed very differently. And in the second step, we can combine those in a two-step, um, in, in a single-step, uh, multi-trait single-step model uh, to get the final uh, uh, result for uh, resilience. And this is also presented in the World Congress in, in session 2013. Uh, Management tools. Um, Donna is not here, and, uh, but uh, there has been the, the thing is to look at now not only the genetics, but all the information you have on, on the cows and uh, basically um, give tools to decide the fate of the cow. So, 
should it be bread, should it be coal, should it be sold. And uh, in particular, I have worked with two management indices, one on the, on the, for the cow to decide uh, the fate of the cow in this context, and another one to set the value for, for beef as, uh, as, a, as a selling. Right, so this was uh, very summary, but uh, here are the contributions and uh, ready for questions. Thank you.